I was playing with this concept for work recently of the future you. You don't really need to know more than that. No one really cares about someone else's work. Okay. But in the process of it, someone was saying, oh yeah, I always think about my future self. Like, oh, my future self is going to love me for this. Or, oh, this is a future you problem. This is not a current Lindsay problem. This is not a present Lindsay problem. This is a future Lindsay problem. I think we do that a lot. Recently, I did a big future you favor. I was going on vacation for like a week and I cleaned my entire apartment. Like one of those cleans you never do. I, I organized every drawer in my room, cabinets, cleaning things out, throwing things away. I came back like internal sunshine of the spotless mind apartment style. I had no memory of doing any of this. And I Future Lindsay, who just got back from vacation, was so proud and happy of pre-vacation Lindsay for this nice present, right? But we don't always do that. We don't always do that. We're not always that nice to our future selves. I think it comes with maturity and comes with burning our future you over and over again. I know I did this in my 20s. I remember Present day Lindsay is pretty nice to future you. But like I said, it comes with practice. It comes with hurting your future self so many times. And in my 20s, I was meaner to future Lindsay than any ex-boyfriend could ever be. I was never planning for her health, for her feelings the next day, for her future down the road. I was never thinking about her one day in the future, let alone one year in the future. It was always present moment. And obviously, there is some learning in that. Live in the present moment, love today, that kind of thing. There's some things for that too. But don't burn yourself in the process. Be nice to your future self. What are you doing? Are you taking care of your health? Are you planning for your finances? Are you looking towards your long-term goals? What are you doing for your future you? So I think there's a lot of learning in just that little concept of are you being nice to your future self or are you burning your future self a year from now is future you gonna write you a love letter so hopefully with some of this these practices we're gonna go through today future you is gonna have a big smile on their face at the end of 2024 ready let's overthink it Welcome to Overthinking in Your Underwear. I'm Lindsay, and this week we are overthinking kind of our goals for um, the new year. So what I'm going to do is, this is the book, Overthinking in Your Underwear. This is kind of a companion podcast. Not really. So if you haven't made it here before, um, this is a self-help podcast. doesn't take itself too seriously. We kind of talk about everything from imposter syndrome to failure. Um, but I wrote this book last year and what I'm going to do this week is go through, there's an exercise at the end of every chapter and I'm going to go through the exercises that I think would be helpful to do in the new year. I don't know if you guys are like me, but every new year is kind of like, I'm always one of those people that's like, this is my year, you know, like I'm one of those new year, new me kind of people. Like in December, I definitely got out my journal and I wrote down my manifestation list. I evaluated my 2023. I looked forward to 2024 and what I wanted. I wrote down what was working about 2023 and what I wanted to change about 2024. I am like such an exercises kind of girl. I love to overthink my life. I mean, what what are we doing here? Obviously. Um, And I love to kind of go through exercises that make me evaluate where I am and see where I can grow and move forward. You know, personal growth is kind of my part-time job. I, I freaking love it. So if you're kind of in in that phase of your life or if it's just an ongoing journey, if personal growth is just an ongoing journey, 
we're going to go through some things that I think can help you um, kind of evaluate and go forward uh, with a strong 2024. One of the things that I heard that is not in the book, and I attribute this to Jesse Itzler, who is the founder of Spanx, Sarah Blakely. It is her husband. So Jesse is... Um, he is a personality and an entrepreneur and a success story in his own right beyond Sarah. Um, they met and they were both uber successful at this point in their life. That's not the point. But Jesse kind of has his own success story separate from Sarah. And he does some speaking on success and being an entrepreneur. And he, I found this clip of him and he was talking about kind of how he always challenges himself. And he's a very... Um, outdoorsy guy. He's always, you know, one of those, like I'm climbing Mount Kilimanjaro type of guys. And he said something that he does is he picks, I'm paraphrasing here. So I'm sure he says it differently. He picks kind of one peak thing, um, to be the focus of his year. So it, it let, I'm just going to give an example. If 2024, he might say, climb Mount Kilimanjaro. And if that's the peak thing, it gives him a passion. It gives him a reason to get out of bed. Now, everybody isn't that kind of person. I would never have my peak thing be something like that, right? My peak thing may be start a podcast. It may be write a book. Your peak thing may be found a charity or even just volunteer at a charity or even volunteer to run the charity auction. Or they can be whatever is in your wheelhouse of passions. He said, you know, he loves doing that because it really gives him like a focus it gives him a reason to get out of bed. It gives him a drive. It gives him a passion to kind of name it and claim it and go for it every year. And I think that's great. And then he also says this thing about imagine if you if you name a peak focus every year and then 30 years later, you look back and you and think of all of the peak moments and the things you will have accomplished in 30 years if that's how you live your life. Because think about all the, you know, we always say like how fast time moves and you can look back and go, wow, nothing happened last year or my year this year was a carbon copy of the year, but the year before. But if you live your life with such intention, there's that word. <laughs> if you live your life with such intention and um, really kind of that focus, you really will put some things on a checklist, right? So um, love that piece of advice, Jesse, es Jesse Etzler. Sure, he has all kinds of socials you can follow. He's a, he's a pretty inspiring guy. So is Sarah Blakely. I love Sarah, and I follow her everywhere, too. Not in real life, I don't follow her. I mean, I would if I knew where she was. I have no idea where she is. The peak focus of this year will be the podcast, um, if I'm naming and claiming it. So there you go to that, okay? So this is your, this is an exercise I really love from towards the end of the book. This is your love it or leave it list. Um, so get out a piece of paper and on the left side of your paper, write down the things you love. So I'm going to keep this career focus just to give you an example. You could do this in your love life or you could do this in your family life or you could do this just in your overall, in your overall life, right? But I'm going to give you an example. So on the left side of my paper, if I was doing my career, the things I love about my career, things I love in a career is writing, psychology, reading, researching, wellness, branding, design, advertising, strategy, problem solving. So on the right side of my paper, I would write down things I would rather leave when it comes to a career, right? So on the, the right side of my paper on my leave list, I would write business matters. I don't want to do anything that has to do with math, taxes, cost, analysis. I don't want to do anything with committees. I don't want to be in charge of a committee, anything like that. Um, I don't really like structured work environments. I would write that down. So after you have made your list, so like I said, it, you could be doing an evaluation of a partnership. 
you could be doing an evaluation um, of how your of how your family runs. You know, like okay, let's just let's see how we're how the household's running. So overthink your love it or leave it list for a few minutes. Right now is your day full of things from your leave it list, and not overflowing with the good stuff from your love from your love list. What steps can you take to change this? Write action steps next to your leave items as you see ways to remove them from your list. So if you're doing this from a career perspective, maybe you see you're not getting to do any of the things you really like and you're only doing the things you don't like anymore. How can you change that? How can you balance that out? Don't accept a a life you'd rather leave. Okay, something else I talk about is the kind of working, not working list. And I think this is really helpful to do. Um, Again, take out that pad and paper. Maybe you still have it out, right? So take out that pad of paper and separate it side by side. And let's make a list of what's working and what's not working. So maybe your list of what's working this is really helps you, I think, put things in perspective. Um, this is a good exercise to do, not just in the beginning of a year or at the beginning of a year, but it's a good exercise to do. If you're feeling really down, I think it can put things in perspective. It can also help you take action steps, right? So take out that list, write what's working on the left, what's not working on the right. So on the left, you might write, what's working? My job's good. My health is good. My relationship with my family's good. You write things like this, right? On the right side, you might, you might write, I'm in debt. I need a better salary. Uh, my drinking's a problem. So what this does is this helps you put things in perspective. You might see... You have so many things strong on the left side. It helps you put things in perspective. And it also helps you see what you need to work on. That not working is really a working list. It's what you need to work on, right? So I'm also a big fan of action steps. So let's say you look at that right side list, not working. And you say, I'm in debt. Okay, well, what does that mean? Can you consolidate to a... 0% credit card and start to pay that down? Can you get a second job? Can you uh, start paying $100 a month off your credit card? Like what are some action steps to get you feeling better about that? A plan is always such an alleviation of that kind of stress. You know, hope is the antidote to stress. It's the hope. It's the antidote to anxiety Give yourself an action plan and you're going to alleviate so much of that stress and anxiety. If it's, you know, I feel like I'm in really bad health, I'm really out of shape, I'm really out of whatever, sign up for the gym, you know, sign up online to go to a gym and have the plan that you're going to go there. I'm not saying just make the plan and, and never go. I'm saying make, take some action steps and really follow through, you know. So look at that what's not working and may put some action behind it and take time to feel grateful for your list of what is working. So I think pers- with the whole goal of this is really perspective and then taking action to move those things off your not working list onto your working list. So love that exercise for the new year and just when you're kind of feeling like you're in a rut. Let's talk about goal setting. One of the biggest reasons I think we don't achieve our goals is because we don't believe we deserve it. We don't believe we're worthy. We don't believe we are someone who should write a book, start a podcast, get that promotion. We don't believe we're worthy, right? So I talk about settling into your excuses. So let's say for 2024, you want to become partner at a law firm. So you write down on your piece of paper, become partner in a law firm. And then I say, settle into your excuses because you're going to give yourself all these excuses about why you don't deserve it. So let's hear them. Lay it out. Settle into your excuses. Write down all the reasons you think you don't deserve to be partner in a law firm. Because I bet it's just this sort of abstract feeling 
that really has no basis, right? And maybe it does have some basis. Maybe you go, I didn't go to as good of a college as the other partners at my law firm. I uh, am as not, I'm not old enough. Uh, I'm not a senior. I don't have as much experience. So you have a few things on there, right? You have a few things on your list. Let's hear the flip side. I have a really strategic mind. I am way more qualified. I nailed that one case last year. I've brought in a ton of business. So let's hear, let's settle into your excuses and then let's hear your argument. Let's hear your argument for why you deserve it. I bet your list is long and strong, right? Argue yourself out of it. And then a big fan of action steps. What's your action steps to get to that? What's your action steps to get to being the partner at the law firm? You need to, I don't know, because I have never even, I don't even know what it means to be a partner at a law firm, but I'll make it up here. Okay, ready? You need to go into work early. You need to ask for more cases. You need to file a lot of briefs. I don't know. See, I have no idea what it means to be a partner at a law firm. So I really should have chose a better example, but you guys get what I'm saying. Settle into your excuses and you'll realize you'll realize how qualified you actually are. And you know what? You might come across an excuse that says, actually, I need to do A, and then you can mark it off. You can take action and mark that off to reach your goal. As you're trying for your goals, failure is inevitable. Um, It's hard to swallow as it happens, but be thankful for it. I mean, no one who is successful has never failed. Um, If you've never failed, you've never tried. I mean, gritty people are successful people. You have to get some of that grit under your nails. So what I I talk about in the book is give yourself a 15-minute overthinking session. If you literally set the timer on your phone, you know it's sitting right there. Um, Set the timer on your phone and allow yourself to evaluate what went wrong. Whether it's writing it down on a piece of paper or meditating on it in your mind, just write down everything that went wrong, how you would proceed differently in the future, or think about it. You know, you can just meditate on it and go, okay, here's what happened. Here's where I could have seen taking a different road or taking a turn. If I get this opportunity in the future, I will do this. I will do that. I will file that brief better if I'm trying to be partner at a law firm. No idea how that works, Um, but you get my point. You're going to give yourself that 15-minute overthinking session, and then you're going to drop it. You're going to move on, and you're going to be better for it in the end. So that's how we deal with failure. So if you're on this little self-help journey, like we all are, and you find yourself continuing a pattern or a behavior, look for the reward right down to the root. So what that means is, let's say you're trying to go for a goal. You're trying to get a promotion at work. You're trying to be a partner at a law firm, right? Uh, You're trying to do this thing and you keep getting in your own way for some reason. Why are you sabotaging yourself? Look for the reward right down to the root. Usually if we're continuing a pattern or behavior, we're getting something out of it. Um, so for instance, if we're not getting the promotion, it's because it's allowing us to play small and kind of not stand in our power and not stand in our self-worth. And we're more comfortable there. We're just more comfortable being small and we actually don't want to take that position, right? So what are you getting out of it? What are you uncomfortable with about that position that you're going for? So get honest with yourself and maybe work out some of that stuff. Like maybe I'm not really going for the, I'm really not getting the promotion and I keep kind of sabotaging myself because I don't want it. Why don't you want it? What's going on there? So Get honest with yourself so you're not working all of your effort isn't working against yourself. Okay. So I talk a little bit about purpose in the book. Um, Purpose is so, I don't even know. What is that word, right? Like your purpose can be, I want to be a mother and I want to start a family. Your purpose can be, 
I want to be happy and I want to travel. Your purpose doesn't have to be a partner at a law firm. I'm just going to keep saying that one, right? Um, but if you're looking and you don't have, you can, you don't have to have a purpose. I think we live kind of in a world where everyone's looking for a purpose and everyone wants to define themselves in this like very branded kind of way. And, and you don't have to, you definitely don't have to, um, being you, being you, Jill Smith is enough. Like you don't have to do any of, any of this like kind of self-defining work, but if this is something you're looking for, um, here's something that I say, I talk about a little bit. I work in advertising, um, and in advertising, brands <laughs> always come to us and they want to figure out who they are. They want to figure out like, what's the essence of us? We needed to define ourselves. And we take them through all of these crazy exercises to figure out like who they are as a brand. And you do everything from if you were a celebrity, the brand, if the brand was a celebrity, who would they be? If they were a car, who would they be? So if the brand was a celebrity, the brand always says they'd be Oprah or they say they'd be George Clooney. Brands always think of themselves as like smart innovators. So they're Steve Jobs. Um, or they think of themselves as cool, refined, classic gentlemen, and they're George Clooney. Or they think of themselves as like um, the every woman who everyone loves, which is Oprah. Um, so they have, they, I mean, they always say these kind of three celebrities, and it's very funny. And every time they say it, we always just go, oh, okay. Um, like it's the first time we've ever heard it. So that's kind of how that branding exercise works is if you were a celebrity, if your brand was a celebrity, who would you be? Little inside baseball there. And then we do this other thing. And every ad agency does these exercises in different ways. But there's another thing we do that I call the five second statement. If you had five seconds to tell people who you are, what would you say? So that what that does is it asks a brand to identify themselves succinctly. So if you were Nike, you would say, we are running shoes for everyday runners right? It just, it just succinctly, ma it makes you succinctly get down to the nuts and bolts of who you are. Because if you don't, most marketing people, this is no fault of theirs, will go on and on about all of rattling off all of the benefits of their brand. And there's a time and a place for that. But you also need like a five second statement about who you are. So one of the exercises I talk about in the book is What's your five second statement? If you had five seconds to tell people who you are, what would you say? I would, it's sort of like your Instagram bio, right? Except we tend to kind of make those goofy and interest, those kind of like goofy and uh, ironic sometimes. They're not really five second statements. Mine says, that I wrote in the book, I'm a writer who loves yoga, all things wellness, and my dog. Um, that's pretty true. That's it's not it's not creative, it's not clever, but it's straightforward to the point and if you know me, you may have said the exact same things about me. Like it's very accurate. So, um I think a 5 second statement is an interesting way to try to find your purpose. So, you may say I love hiking and outdoors and all things design. I have a picture in my mind right now about what that person is like. Okay, I get it. I get it. So maybe you could get a design job in Colorado. Kind of helps you go, this is the thing that I am defined by. This is the thing that drives me, that guides me, that gets me up in the morning. Do I have enough of that in my life? Is my life surrounded by it? Am I centered by this? You know, is my job around it? Do I live around it? 
that kind of thing. And we aren't all fortunate enough to have our jobs around it, but maybe your, ho your hobby is it. If you said, I'm a hiker who loves design, do you have enough design in your hobby if that can't be your job? Do you have enough hiking in your weekend? That kind of thing. So it just kind of helps you make sure you have enough of that stuff in your life that you feel like you're defined by. So it doesn't have to be Grand Canyon grandiose. If your purpose is, I am a mother who wants kids and you aren't married, go go find a way to have a family. There's so many ways to have a family. You can adopt. You could have a child on your own. I mean, there. it doesn't have to be like, this doesn't have to all be like centered around your career. When I talk about finding our purpose, I also talk about distractions. And I feel like our life is nothing but distractions. <laughs> I don't even know what we're distracting ourselves from. That's like kind of a longer existential conversation. But our life is nothing but TV, social media, drinking, everything is a distraction. Like literally everything is a distraction. And like I said, that's kind of a longer conversation. But um, if you're fine, if for the purposes of this conversation, if you're saying I want to go hiking and work on my design, what and, and there's none of that in my life. There's none of it in my life. If you're saying I want to start a family and there's none of that in my life, what are your distractions? What is the distraction that's keeping you from doing that? Because you're distracting yourself with going out and partying and that's why you haven't started a family yet. Are you distracting yourself with staying with the wrong partner too long and that's why you haven't started a family yet? Are you distracting yourself with the wrong job and that's why you don't have a job in design and really you just are too afraid to use your design skills and you, you afraid, you're afraid you afraid you're not good enough. Like we use, we have all of these ways of distracting ourselves from what we really want. It's really kind of, it's kind of funny because it's like we talk about happiness so much. We buy books on happiness. We listen to podcasts on happiness. We talk about it so much, yet we have so many ways from distracting ourselves from it and for sabotaging ourselves from it. It seems like we always are kind of taking the other path away from it when the answers to it are frankly pretty easy. It's like, Go for what you want. Eliminate the things that don't make you happy. And it seems like we're always sabotaging ourselves from it. We're always sabotaging ourselves from, ha from happiness despite how much we say we want it. So what are those distractions that are keeping you from that five-second statement, that five-second statement that you said you wanted? You said you wanted the family. You said you wanted a job in design. What are you doing that's distracting yourself from that? Like, what are all of your distractions? I have so many. I cannot put down my goddamn phone. I look at TikTok, honestly, like goddamn TikTok. I think it's so entertaining. Like, I really think it's so funny. I, I scroll and scroll and scroll. I have to give myself a timer is what I do. I'll say, you can watch this for five minutes and then you have to put your phone down. I would watch it for two hours. Like, I know you guys all do too, right? Um, I think it's so crazy. This is a side note about how TikTok is consumed by the younger generation. I'll go into my nephew's room and I'm like, oh, what are you doing? And back in my day, Gen X day, I would have been watching Family Ties on TV or Full House or whatever. And he'll say, watching TikTok, watching TikTok, quote unquote. That's what, that's what he does is like, he watches it like it's TV and I watch it a lot, but I try not to watch it like it's TV pretty much only because it hurts my eyes because the phone's so small, not because I don't find it like utterly entertaining. I do. I think it's freaking hilarious, but I think it's so funny how like now almost TV has been, I mean, TV has been replaced by TikTok. I'll ask my niece and my nephew, what shows do you watch? And most of the time, my nephew flat out says, I watch TikTok. That's what he watches. And I just wonder what the evolution of entertainment will be based on that. So that has nothing to do with our subject, but it is something I was overthinking. So there you go. 
social media is a huge distraction for me. <laughs> huge. TV is a huge distraction. I kind of tell myself that it's a positive one because I really don't watch it until, you know, nighttime. I'm going to bed. I love to turn on the Bravo and just let my mind go, you know, nowhere and watch these people go crazy. And it's like my favorite mindless distraction. I know it is, you know, I have complete peace of mind because I know how many people enjoy it with me. And I just, I love it. Right. I lean into it. I have no problem with it. Um, so I mean, I have a million distractions. We all do, but make sure they're not getting in the way of what you really want to do. Use them wisely, I will say. Like, I feel like I use Bravo wisely. TikTok, I do not always use wisely. Make sure your distractions are not working against you. Like I say, you know, you don't have to wake up tomorrow and throw your smartphone out the window. Just find a balance, you know, chip away, give yourself a time limit, uh, replace some of your distractions with healthy habits give, you know, say I'm only going to watch Bravo after nine o'clock at night, like these kinds of things and, and use them in a healthy way. I'll leave you with my favorite quote. Aristotle said, we are what we repeatedly do. So keep at it and you will get to your goals. Um, thanks for overthinking with me this time. Thank you for overthinking with me this week. And until next time, wishing you all good thoughts.